All right, well, as Adrian said, I've got a cold. So the effect that I want from this sermon is that you would gain some sniffles <laughs> and that those snizzle, sniffles would bear fruit and become a full-blown cold <laughs> by this afternoon. No, I'm kidding. Uh, but I might, my voice might break and all those type of things, so I just ask you to look past all that. Um, let's pray. Lord God, I just thank you for your word. Thank you so much that we have it, that, Lord, we can read your very words. And so I pray, Lord, that you would increase and I would decrease, that people would leave today as if you'd spoken directly to them. Lord, you would set them on that path, that path that is a path of love, the same path that Jesus walked, Lord. And we have his spirit. So Holy Spirit, I just ask that you would take these words. We need your power to change us, make us more like Jesus. So help us to see him today, to listen, and to go and do what he says. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I'm just going to read. We're, um, we're in John 15, so you can open your apps to John 15 or hard copies if you've got it. Hard copies are probably better because then you don't get as distracted. Uh, chapter 15, verse 12. So we've broken up these two parts um, of, of chapter 15. There's actually a third part as well coming. So, um, so uh, chapter 15, verse 12, reading through to 17. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, so that you will love one another. I want to start with a question this morning. Um, what is love? What is it for you, Ben? What do you love? <laughs> yep. So it's like a heartfelt sort of Desire. Surge kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You feel it. You feel it. Would people relate to that? What you, Ben's saying? Your the whole. comes down the aisle on your wedding day. No. When you see your kids come to want to give you a, you know, run to you. Daddy, I want to give you a hug. Yep. You know, it's those sorts of things. It's, your, it's knowing your mum, you know, prayed for you. During the last yep. Years. Those sorts of things. Okay, cool. Sorry, mate. Sorry. No, that's, that's a great answer. I don't need to ask anyone else for... I thought you were going to give me one thing, but you gave me like 10. No, that's right. We, we use it a lot, don't we? And we assume a lot about the word. Um, and, and yet when we look at the world as well, how the world uses the word love, you know, it's such a throwaway term in this day and age. It's, it's a word that's been labelled on things that it never should have. You know, our culture has dragged it through that many places that the word in many cases is reduced to a fleeting sexual experience or a romantic moment between a couple or just in many ways idolatry on, on things that we love created things that we love and it's a tragedy because the word was never meant for lesser things indeed there's really only one place we can go to find its true meaning the home of love 
And the home of love is a safe and glorious place, a place of power, a place of glory. No idols, no distractions. Indeed, love's home lies in but one place, in the very heart of God. For God is love. So maybe a better question is, who is love? Of all the claims of love, God is the one that proves true. There is not one claim of love in this world that isn't broken. Every human crafted attempt of love is broken. And if you haven't seen it break, if it's something in your life, Just wait and it will. And that goes for us too, not just the world out there, but that's for us, every single person in this room. But God himself is unbreakable. He isn't broken like all our ideas, our efforts. He is pure. And I don't know about you, but I'm so thankful that the God that rules this planet, this universe, is a God of love. And if you aren't a Christian here today, then what matters is will you accept Jesus for his love or will, you, or will you just continue to seek it elsewhere? And if you are a Christian, you need to think very carefully about how you use this word, what actions you attribute to love, because when you do that, you are claiming to act like God in the power of God. For God is love. And so my goal in today's sermon is that this command that Jesus is going to give us wouldn't cripple your love, but the opposite, that you would see Jesus as so special and the depths that he has gone to display his love, that you would gladly and willingly obey his commands, which is to say you will go and lay down your lives for those in this church and the world. Now, if you look at the word love in the Bible, it's, it's used a lot. Um, we've got the, the noun of love, you know, God is love. Then we've got the verbs of love. We can think of verses. Um, often we think about that in terms of when we think of the word love in the Bible, thinking about the, the doing passages. You know, John, 1 John 3 says, Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. You know, most of us would agree that Talk is pretty cheap when it comes to claiming to love God. Maybe because it's so easy to say, and we've all been guilty of claiming to love God without our actions showing it. And so that's what I tend to gravitate to, this idea of love of, yep, I've got to be busy doing something. But then you come to the Corinthians church and we're told that it's quite possible to look like you are loving and not be that the actions, the doing of love can be right, but you can have no love at all. This is what Paul says. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. I really wish I had a cymbal here that I could just irritate you guys with it. I bet Paul did too when he said that, Um, wrote that. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, And if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. It's quite possible to be seen to be loving and be far from it. So what is Paul and John getting at here? that should make us question our loving efforts. All these things we talk about that we do that we love. Our heartfelt desires. How are we to know we are truly loving and being obedient to Jesus' commands? It says this in 1 John. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God. Because God is love. So here we see that love comes from God. And it comes from him because it is a part of who he is. 
It's not this mystical thing off to the side. It's a part of God. It's connected to him. Do you see how John reasons with us? It's a package. You can't claim to know God, to know love himself, and not be loving to each other. If you don't, you simply don't know God. No matter how hard you try to tell people. You can say you love them, you can do, you know, all these type of things. But if you're not loving towards people, then, yeah, it's just like I have this experience in the car when I drive along that I get cut off from people all the time. Or it's always the times when you're running late to work that you seem to get all the red lights. And then on the days where you don't need it, maybe you're eating something and you're like, oh man, I really just wish I could stop for five minutes at these lights. You get green lights all day. You know, but it ticks us off, doesn't it, when, when something like that happens. And yet, we're told that we need to be loving. And so, the context of what we're going to talk about this morning is essentially the church. So, I have a question for you. Is this church full of love? Is it? You know, what's grading you right now? Is there something, something has happened in the service that irritates you? <laughs> oh, I'm almost done, mate. <laughs> you know, have we got grudges that, that we hold on to that, that cripples the way we love people? Like, maybe it might be a personality clash or something like that. You know, you got a list for this church? I bet some of you do. We need to be very careful here because... Anyone who does not love does not know God. That's not me. That's God saying that. But let's unpack this even more. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. You notice how the love of God, it starts with heartfelt affection in the heart, but the act comes later. God demonstrates perfect love here. You know, love is born out of a heartfelt desire that leads to an action. And Jesus, I'm sorry, Paul explains this about God's love in Ephesians. He says, even as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. So when did God start loving you? Was it before the world was created or was it when Jesus was on the cross? The heartfelt desire began in the heart of God. This is what's amazing. Before the world was even created, before, before we were even here, before there was a cross, there was love. And this plan of love was made so you and I could enjoy God's love and praise him for it forever. What I'm wanting you to see through going through all these passages is that love must start with God. It's a looking to God as the source of love, glorifying in that love, the one who is love, and that time you spend looking, being satisfied And when you do that, it should fire you up to go and love in action. So I guess you'd probably want to have an example after all that. What does love look like? Surely if God claims to be love, then we must have something, some loving action taking place. 1 John 3. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. There's the greatest act of love that has ever happened in this world. Jesus has willingly laid down his life for you. All of us are guilty before the Father. Guilty and deserving of eternal judgment. You know, God owes you nothing. He owes none of us anything but judgment. Because we love sin, we love the darkness... We love shunning the true God, all the while trying to become 
are God ourselves. And you read enough of the Bible, you see that God's anger burns against that. He's very angry. And as the acts of God, as the acts of God's wrath and judgment is coming down on your head, that's when Jesus steps in and says, I'll take their place. Kill me instead. If we want to know what love looks like, look to God's Son hanging on a cross in your place. The path to loving others starts at the cross. It's what directs, it's what shapes our love because it is the single greatest love event to take place. It's what God holds up as the ultimate act of love. And we need to spend time looking, thinking about this, not just always doing. We need to think about the nails, the betrayal, the mocking. It's amazing that God would love us. And as I, as I think, as I look and reflect on Jesus on the cross, I find myself asking, how should I react to this? How do we react to such love? And he said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And God is calling you to love him back and also to love others. And do you think he's doing this because he wants payback? Never. He wants you to love so little by little you become more like him. As you receive love from Jesus, you can't help but love others. And when you do that, you become like him. So we're not even to the John 15 yet. So that's a really long introduction about love, but I want you to understand the importance of what Jesus is about to say. I want when you hear the word love to think of the lengths that God has gone to make you his own. Because we can just skip through this text really easily and it can be in one ear and out the other. But most importantly, I want you to see that love is more fully experienced when you are obedient and love others. Now, you're swimming in a culture where this word love is thrown about all the time. So I want us to see that this love, this word love, it starts with God. It's a very special part about who he is. Remember that as we go through. So let's read verse 1. John 15, 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Now, if you remember, this command is in the context of the vine passage that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. And to paraphrase it, only the ones who abide in Jesus, namely his love, produce fruit and prove to be his disciples. Now, the disciples hearing this would have no doubt been wondering about life after Jesus. He's told them many times he'll be leaving soon. And how will they go? And after lovingly warning them without him that they can do nothing, he interjects this command that they love one another as he has loved them. Notice he doesn't just say, all right, guys, peace, love. See you later. I'm going to the cross. No, he says, love each other as I have loved you as if to give them the ultimate act to look to on how to treat each other. Verse 13, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. The pinnacle of love in the kingdom of God follows directly from the king. Laying down of life, forgetting about your needs, forgetting about yourself, going without for the sake of someone else. It's all modeled off Jesus. The disciples don't know it yet, but they will soon realize what Jesus means. This laying down of life will not just be a teaching of Jesus, but it will be lived out in his death on the cross. Jesus has told them to model the love for each other, to model it off the way he has loved them. 
And he's saying the ultimate love happens when your life is given for your friends. So what that means for us is if if you're serious about love here at Willowburn, it will cost you. And you'll gladly give it because when love is genuine, when it looks to God, when it's not just a secret heartfelt desire, but both born out of love for God, the same love that took Jesus to the cross is flowing through you. When you lay down your life, you are modelling the very love Jesus gave. This is why there's no room in God's love for complaining or gossiping or, or keeping transactions about how others have treated you in the church. You know, we, we just naturally react like that. We love to fight back, to even the score, to fantasise about justice in our minds, to have the last say. You know, do we keep accounts for too long in this church? Now, some of us can't even eat together because we've got grudges that we've kept. Silly little things that stop us from communing with each other. And we take that grudge and we spill it out on a Christian brother or Christian sister. Now, what is that? Do we feel better about our little gossip sessions? That is not love. And on the flip side of that, some of us don't want any accounts. We don't want to be kept accountable. We don't want the tough love conversations. And so we just keep running. Keep running back to the same old habits that cripple us week in and week out. And it's making you more cold to God's love and the love of his people. And the tragedy in that is that if you keep running, in 10 years' time, you might not even be a Christian. You won't care about the love of God. All because you never let the love of God deal with you. It's not love. Friends, we're we're so guilty of this, these extremes so often. And it's not love. It isn't Jesus. Jesus. If you aren't on the path to sorting this out, then these words of Jesus are just some nice pipe dream, a nice thought that Jesus is giving us, you know, not an ideal that's out there, but not anything to be lived. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. This passage of scripture, Jesus is addressing how we as a church love each other. I know the command to love is not restricted to just the church, but here his focus is on us. It's on the disciples. How on earth are we to love each other? Sorry, how on earth are we to love the world when we can't even love each other? There's no account, no, none of this, oh, well, if you do this, I'll do this for you. Got to fix that up. It's such an Australian way to think, isn't it? We hate to know that someone doesn't have it together. We don't want to be seen as that person that doesn't have it together, financially struggling. And then when we are found needing to be helped, we're like, oh, she'll be right, mate. Got no money in the the bank account. Don't know what I'm going to eat tonight, but she'll be right, mate. We don't even know how to accept love. She'll be right, mate. What is that? Now, Jesus is cutting right through all that rubbish and that facade And he says, you know what, Christian, Willowburn, you just love. And stop worrying about whether someone likes it on Facebook or you get recognition. You keep holding those prayer meetings even if nobody shows up. You're not doing it for an audience. You keep praying for that unbelieving workmate, even though it seems their heart is getting harder and harder and harder. Now, why can I say this? (laughs) Because it's what Jesus did. Jesus didn't stop performing loving miracles because certain people only followed him for the latest party trick. You know, like there's probably that three or four in the crowd that are like, oh man, I'm going to get some more bread and fish today. (laughs) 
You know, like he could have, he could have just gone, oh, there's those guys, I'm just going to give the whole thing away. He just kept doing it. It's just amazing. Like he just got taken advantage of so often. And you think of his disciples, they said so much dumb stuff. And then when it mattered, they, they ran off. It's like, well, you're going to die, then I'm, I'm going that way. Run for the hills. What did Jesus do? Was he sitting there just like gritting his teeth and, you know, cursing under his breath? He was praying for them. He was loving them. And the ultimate act, Jesus didn't lay, leave the cross because it was too hard. He didn't quit when the stress and the pain was unbearable. He hung there and he loved you. And we didn't give a crap. We didn't care. We were for happy for him to go and hang there. And there is love itself until his final breath. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Well, let's cut through the emotion, Tim. I'm not Jesus. You're not Jesus. You know, you're absolutely right. But his same spirit is in you. It's in all of us. The same spirit that was in Jesus, that is in Jesus. Maybe it's time we stop thinking about what we should get for our love or how many likes we get on Facebook. Maybe it's time we just love with no strings attached. Just love for the sake of him. Is that enough? Laying down our life means to give your life up to give up the result it's the idea that you aren't there for the medal presentation you gave up your life how zealous are we to love each other like this do you see what we're missing out on the more love means more love of God it means more of God that's what we're missing out on that's why I can challenge you like this because we're missing out on experiencing more and more of the love of God, of individually and corporately becoming more like Jesus, being taken to the very place that love lives, the heart of God. That's where the church is headed. Do you want to be there? Now, I know there's love in this church. I've experienced it. But my challenge to you today is our love a laying down of our life type love? What does that even look like? Are we just being nice? Verse 14 You are my friends if you do what I command. Sorry, if you do what I command you. I think it's another way of saying like he did back in verse 8, if you pop up there. If you do this, you are proving to be my disciples. Only now he's saying it in a much more personal way, that you're his friend. And you're a friend of Jesus if you obey his commands. Which, it, it's remarkable when we think of all the names and titles that Jesus could give you. Servant, creation, no, he, could give us, he could give us those names and it'd probably still be loving because it's true. But instead, he just goes for full-blown mateship. Now, we've got to be careful with this verse because he's not saying, be obedient, that makes you my friend. Otherwise, you're going to go out there, you're going to fall on your face and then you think Jesus isn't my friend. That's not what he's saying. He's saying obedience is a sign you are his friend. So my question to you, Willow Byrne, is are you a friend of God? How do you feel that God is commanding you to do something right now? He's commanding you to love. Does it feel like a burden? <laughs> or the words of a friend? Jesus goes on as if being his friend wasn't enough. He explains our standing even further. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. 
but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. This is the God of the universe talking to mere man. He is no longer a servant, but a friend. No longer is God far away, you being left out of the room at the dinner table when the plans of the day are being discussed. That's the picture we're given. But instead you're invited in and all Jesus has heard from the Father, he makes known to you. What other God makes claims like this? This is love. Undeserving, table-waiting sinners like us. Invited to the Master's table. And the secrets of God are made plain to us through the bond of friendship. And Jesus ramps it up again. He says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. So that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Now we touched on this last week, but Jesus is wanting, oh sorry, a couple of weeks ago, Jesus is wanting us to ask things of God that he might give and give. But notice how Jesus builds to this amazing ability to ask of God. He doesn't start with it. So for the disciples to be told that they were chosen, it must have made sense, I think. Um, because, you know, Jesus sought them out. He called them off, you know, fishing boats. It's like, yeah, yeah, you chose us. It probably makes sense to them. Um, and Jesus isn't here. Sorry. Yeah, so for us, we don't have Jesus in the flesh. He's not rocking up at Ergon or Sleepless City and saying, drop the coffee machine, you're coming with me, come follow me. But we have been chosen by him. Our earlier Ephesian, Ephesians passage took us deeper to describe how God had loved us before the world was even created. And this should humble us to think when we run to God. We need to remember he started running for you a long, long time ago. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And once he gets you, once you come to grips with the love he has for you, how his son has taken your place on the cross, he wants you to run after others and use whatever means needed for them to know God is running after them also. That he loves them too. That you should go and bear fruit, that your fruit should abide. Notice he wants our fruit to abide. Please don't let your fruit spoil because you don't get the outcome you wanted. Or because your expected results don't equal the energy you're putting in. Lay your life down and don't look up from the grave. Lay it down that your fruit should abide. And it's in this context that Jesus tells us to ask whatever we wish of the Father. Not for a you know, flash new car or a six-figure salary. I hope you're not praying for that. But he's talking about souls here. It's a kingdom prayer. And anything that will keep you loving like Jesus, that's the stuff the Father loves to answer. He just will give that. Verse 17, these things I command you so that you will love one another. Now Jesus ends here where he starts. This love business that Jesus talks about, it isn't negotiable. You sign up for Jesus' team, then you play by his rules. And his rule is love. It's not a love you can keep secret. It's not an individualistic love. God's love comes into you that it might keep moving and draw more people in. You know, when we put the girls to sleep at night, we, we generally read a story, sing them a song and pray. And most nights it just feels like you're just going through the motions and you're sort of, oh, I'm thinking, we're putting in so much effort for these kids. Does it, is it really registering? Do they really love us? It's almost liturgical. It's like, now we're going to sing the song 
Now we're going to pray the Bible reading. And I'll ask for it in that order. It's, it's strange. Um, but I remember when Tiffany was in the hospital, I think for a knee or something like that, or one of the girls had tonsils removed, and they just bawl their eyes out when mummy's not home. I miss my mummy. I love my mummy. Mummy loves us a lot. And they're just like, oh, they'll just cry themselves to sleep. I'm like, where's this come from? You know, some of us, I fear, are just like that with the love of God. We're so used to the same outcomes, same church service, same prayer, same workplace politics, and God just seems distant. He's assumed, not forgotten, but assumed. And it takes a crisis in your life to remember that the God of love has never left your side. He's in this boring church service. He is. He's in that dry conversation with that work colleague. He's in that driving along and then a Volvo driver cuts you off on the way to work. I do like Volvos. And it's usually before you've had a coffee in the morning too. (sighs) And God's in that. Often when we assume the love of God, it's because we haven't made time to look at it and haven't had its reality fall afresh to turn those incredibly mundane, boring, irritating moments of life into opportunities to love and be thankful. When was the last time you just sat and read about the majesty of God? Not just looking for how to love, be practical, but just sitting and looking, reveling in who Jesus is, your saviour, your commander, your Lord, your friend. Now, there's a reason commandment number two, love for your neighbour, is similar, but proceeds the first commandment. If your heart, mind and soul are not filled with wonder, reverence for God, then all your frozen meals, all your lawn mowing, becomes a pretty miserable existence. And Jesus commands us to love each other because he knows what's at stake. Now, imagine the early church, what they would have looked like if the disciples hadn't taken Jesus seriously. Would we still even have a church? Where will Willowburn be in five years? What will we look like? Jesus knows what can happen in an unloving church. He also knows what a loving church can accomplish. So what are we? What are you? These things I command so that you will love each other. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I just want to stop and I just want to look. I want to forget about all the jobs that are going to be done this afternoon. The bills that are going to be paid. (coughs) The nappies that are going to be changed. Lord, I just want to stop and look. I just want to love you for my heart, mind and soul. I want to think about your son hanging on the, in that cross, on that cross, in my place. Oh Lord, forgive us for not sitting long enough. Not looking to the God who is love and thinking that somehow we can love each other. Oh Lord God, I just thank you for your son who came and said these words and then lived it.
Lord, would you be with us as we as we take communion, as we remember this great gift. Your body broken. Your blood poured out. Lord, how can we eat of this meal and not but love? Lord, would you show us now the things in our hearts, our lives, that aren't love? Things that we've been holding on to, Lord, maybe for years. Lord, I just pray for this church, Lord, that these next five years would be one defined by love. A love that looks to you, expresses itself in action, and in turn loves the world. Would you help us in Jesus' name? Amen. Just feel it really necessary after it. The real thing that hit me about going through these verses is how often I don't sit and just think about God. I'm always coming to the Bible for the practical stuff. I'll do a study and I'll be, what do I do? What do I do with it? And I can see why I get so frustrated. It's because I'm just looking to Jesus as an example, not to Jesus as love. And so I'm not going to play a song during communion. I'm going to give you guys moments to come up and just sit and think about him. We're not going to rush through it. We're going to take a good 10 minutes. And I just want you to take the bread in your own time and just really think about that picture of love. You might have a hundred things that you know you've got to change in your life. That's fine, but we'll deal with them after. This time now is to look to him. Spend time with him. Remember that God is love. And then we'll deal with our lists later. You want to break the bread?